Welcome to this very special Tech Week 2019 webinar, Emerging Trends and Technologies in Higher Education, with guest presenters, Dr. Vicki Cook and Ray Schroeder. This webinar is brought to you by Human Resources, Instructional Technology, the Library, and the Academy for Teaching Excellence at Harper College. My name is Melissa Basinger, and I'm an Instructional Design Specialist in the Academy for Teaching Excellence. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our presenters today, Dr. Vicki Cook and Ray Schroeder. Dr. Vicki Cook is the Executive Director of the Center for Online Learning, Research, and Service, or COLORS, an Associate Research Professor in the College of Education at the University of Illinois Springfield. Vicki has been actively engaged providing consulting and faculty development with educational leaders across the U.S. and in Mexico. She worked as part of a team that authored the University Professional and Continuing Education Association, UPCA, Hallmarks of Excellence in Online Leadership. She teaches online in the Masters of Arts in Education graduate degree program at UIS. Vicki has served on several regional and national committees, as well as having been a longtime member of the Illinois Council on Continuing Higher Education, serving in multiple roles on the executive board. Vicki serves on the board for UPCA, has served as a mentor for the Association for Continuing and Higher Education, is a member of the Online Learning Consortium, and has served on program steering committees for the UPCA Annual Conference and OLC Annual Conference. Ray Schroeder is Professor Emeritus, Associate Vice Chancellor for Online Learning at UIS, and Senior Fellow Founding Director of the, U the National Council for Online Learning at UPCA. His career and publications focus on the application of technology to enhance teaching and learning. Ray founded the UIS Office of Technology Enhanced Learning in 1997, which later became Colors, combining support for the essential online faculty responsibilities into one unit. Ray has been recognized with many awards for his work, including the 2018 Albert Nelson Marquis Who's Who Worldwide Lifetime Achievement Award, recognizing more than 20 years of leadership in the field and the 2016 United States Distance Teaching and Learning Association Hall of Fame Award for significant contributions to the field of distance learning through leadership, technology, research, and teaching. On behalf of Harper College, I want to extend a very warm welcome to both Vicki and Ray. Before I turn it over to Vicki, I'll just take a moment to look at the agenda for our webinar today. Vicki will start by discussing how students of today are changing and what that means for higher education. We'll hold a Q&A session with Vicki, during which you can type your questions for her into the chat area. We'll then turn it over to Ray, who will discuss up and coming technological changes impacting higher education. We will conclude with a Q&A session with Ray. So at this time, um, we'll give a moment for um, Vicki to share her presentation materials, and I will post a link to those presentation materials in the chat. I'm posting that right now, and I will turn it over to Vicki. Good morning. It's good to be with you all. We're going to be talking about Generation Z students, and um, then we'll find out a little bit about why students are a little different than what we've seen in the past. Before we start, I want to mention that we always use a web tool using Google Sites to provide our presentation content. That way you all can Use that information however you'd like to. In the future, you can go back to it, you can refer to it, you can share it on. And so you have the link to the site, and you'll be able to utilize that if you want to check anything out as you go forward. Let's start by looking at... I have lived long enough to see the same eyes in different people. I see your eyes. I know your eyes. Follow me. Star Wars The Force Awakens. Every generation has a story to tell. Do we have some Star Wars fans in the audience today? I want to make sure that you understand that when we think about our students, whether they're online or whether they're face-to-face, -face, 
we need to think about the eyes of our students. Our students aren't the computer screen that we're looking at. I'm not standing talking right now to a screen. I'm talking to the people on the other side of the screen. So we want to make sure that we remember our students' eyes. What happens to those students in their individual lives is what they bring into the classroom. And that's regardless of whether they're face-to-face -face or online. So as we think about our students in context, let's think about that our students want to be learned, want to learn. They don't want to be taught. Generation Z students are those students who were born between 1995 and 2012. They are right now around 24 years of age, and they are students who are very cognizant of digital of the digital world and what is happening in the world. They know exactly how to connect using digital devices. They know what is going on both physically and digitally. So they look at learning very differently than previous generations did. Typically, they're going to hold 17 jobs. They're going to have five careers. And they're learning at a time when automated intelligence and um, augmented reality and many other forces are playing on the classroom as well as life in general. And Ray will go into many of those things when he talks about emerging trends and emerging um, ideas in the digital world. But these students have been called FIGITAL. And I've included a link here that you might find interesting regarding a fidgetal student, one that is both present in the physical world and present in the digital world. In this particular author's view, there are a few things that we can think about regarding how we interact with this generation of students. Number one, digital is king. Everything really needs to be connected to the digital world. And many of you know that this, this particular generation is often cited as not being terribly attentive to what is going on in the physical world. The truth of the matter is, is that with Generation Z, you have eight to 10 seconds to actually catch the student. At the end of that eight to 10 seconds, they will go on to something else if their attention has not been caught. So it isn't that they don't have an attention span, it's that you have a very short time frame to actually catch their interest to draw them in to a particular topic or learning activity. Additionally, this, is, this particular uh, generation is very insistent on having an individualized approach to life. They have been given a lot of individualization in their K-12 experience. They learned how to really look at what they were doing as um, part of a group, but also how that affected them as individuals. So individualization is critical when we think about planning for activities and assessments in our classes. There are a number of ways that we can do that. Adaptive learning is one way that we can make learning much more individualized. But you don't have to go the entire adaptive learning route. If you want to make particular assessments and assignments more customizable by allowing students to choose what are some ways that they can show that they have mastered particular learning outcomes. Finally, um, real world relevance is so critically important to this generation. This is a generation that has had some significant experiences that have played upon their development. Uh, many of them were in kindergarten when um, the 9-11 happened and the Twin Towers came down. And over and over and over, they saw um, the Twin Towers falling on TV. That's what they heard in the news when they were five and six years old. Then in 2008, we had a major recession. And that caused families to lose homes, 
parents to lose jobs. The economy was no longer stable. And this generation has dealt with those types of insta instability, in, uh, I can't speak this morning, unstable approaches in their lives. And it has made them very cognizant of the fact that there are definitely winners and losers in life. There are things that are not going to go well, and they can't depend on the economy to always be the way that it is today. They also are dealing with more student debt than has ever been dealt with in the past. And so they have some very difficult choices to make when they think about being connected to an institution for four years in order to receive a degree. So how can your institution help them understand what they need to be able to get a good job? What do they need to be able to make enough money to pay back their student loans, to take care of their families? How can they be more entrepreneurial? This particular generation also is looking for ways that they can both complete a bachelor's degree program, be well employed, and perhaps have a second job or a third job to assist with making money to be able to pay off student loans. That has been termed in many ways the slash degree. And the slash degrees used to be called moonlighting. But today, students are looking for degree opportunities that will allow them to be a teacher slash photographer, an accountant slash waiter. They want to be able to have very good experiences across the board that will help them build skills in multiple ways and they are very very entrepreneurial in being able to do that. Most of these students entered college between 2013 and 2014. So when you think about students who are currently in your classrooms even though we often have multi-generational classrooms our youngest students are part of this Generation Z. Generation Z students are more alike baby boomers than either of the previous two generations that exist between the Gen Z students and the baby boomer students. So it is really important to think about how you can use that connecting point for baby boomers and Gen Z students as you think about how you build activities and sharing opportunities within your classroom. Whatever you look at, it is important to be engaged and increase student engagement to launch students into successful careers. More than any other time in history, that is very important to this generation. Take a look at this video and make sure that you read the captions that go with it.
the CEO of Project Tomorrow has a great quote. She said, kids today have grown up with technology. They're looking for experiences that use technology purposefully and not frivolously. And this, this generation is all about purposefulness. They are not about frivolity in any, in any part of their lives. If you saw on the, the YouTube video that I just shared with you, one of the things they want to be is relevant. They really want to be relevant to the society. They want to be relevant in every aspect of their life. They want to make a difference. So this, this particular group of students is really more connected and more able to understand how their actions play upon not only their local situation, but also the global promise of the world. And what that means is that these are students who are really interested in projects and opportunities to learn and grow outside of the classroom. Experiential learning is extremely important to this group of students. So let's talk a little bit about how college is different today than it was in the past. For first, more students are going to college than ever before. Between 2000 and 2017, we saw an increase of 5.1 million students. College is more competitive than ever. Acceptance rates at competitive colleges have actually decreased. College is more expensive. We've talked a little bit about that already. Every time that you read anything in higher ed, you see more information about the debt load that students carry. College tuition has more than doubled since 1985. And the stat isn't listed, but the assistance with scholarships and with uh, federal grants has decreased. And so that makes it even more difficult for students who are trying to pay for their tuition. Textbooks cost much more. Textbook costs are up 812% since 1985. There are two particular uh, uh, content areas where students drop out significantly simply because of textbook costs. And the first one is computer science, and the second one is business. And those two disciplines have the most, um, the, the textbooks that have actually increased the most in the past 10 years. More technology is used in teaching and learning. I'm sure that all of you today would say that you are using more technology now than you've used in the past five to 10 years. We are using technology. We also have more technology tools to use. And again, Ray will touch on some of those um, when he talks, but there are a, a, there's a plethora of technology tools that people can use, and many of those are free. Online learning is a huge factor. 69% of millennials think they learn better with technology than from people. Of this particular survey that was done, 50% of the respondents were older than 45 when they said that. Students are more diverse than ever. In 1970, we had 15% diversity. In 2018, 42% of diversity among students. In 1970, less than half of the students in college were female, and in 2018, more than half are female. Fewer students today identify with organized religion. In 2005, more than 25% identified with organized religion. In 2014, less than 16% of students identified with a specific organized religion organization. And students experience stress levels at higher levels today than ever before. 70 to 80% of students have a job while attending school, which adds to the stress, and 40% of them work more than 30 hours a week. Again, going back to trying to um, provide for the cost of the education. So I want to finish my component of, um, of this particular section of your webinar today by showing a video to give you some idea of, um, a, a, of what an eight-year-old who was born in 2005, he's a little older than that, that now, obviously, he's 14, what, but he was eight when he, when he recorded this video, and he provides a lot of insight into what Gen Z is. I was born in 2005.
The year North Korea announced they have nuclear weapon. In the last few weeks, a large amount of ugly, malicious information has The same been year, Michael Jackson was not, not guilty of child molestation charges. Born, the opposition parties in Singapore won two seats in the parliament. <laughs> then one year later, Apple unveiled iPhone. I belong to Gen Z, a generation born with complete technology. We have PC smartphones, gaming devices, tablets, MP3 players and the internet. We text, read, watch and work at the same time. A skill that stuns the adults. We like to express our feelings and thoughts and share them with the world. In our lifetime, we will not send a single letter by mail. But we would spend at least 20% of our time on social media. Having too many gadgets also has a bad impact. We rather stay indoors and use our gadgets than play outdoors and be active. We have terrible social skills. We are 10 times more likely to smile to a handphone than a person. Our attention span is as short as a goldfish. Second before you lose us. If I go to university, I will be looking at a heavy study load. When I graduate, I will be competing in a tight job market. Again, 7 million for talent. I will meet my future wife in a dating website with plastic surgery and makeup. All girls will look like some Korean actress. We are told we are special and we believe it. I want to be an MP when I grow up. I will work from home my dining table next to my kitchen. I will deliver my speech with a green screen behind me. I will wear a shirt, a tie and a pair of shorts. I don't need to control the media. All I need is a Facebook and YouTube account. Yes, we can! Just like Obama. So I hope you found the insight into uh, Generation Z by a person who is part of Generation Z interesting. Um, one of the things that uh, he noted in there was the lack of social skills and this is a, a topic that comes up regularly. These students have not been uh, not have not grown up in an, an era where they are um, taught to, to look at someone as they speak with them. They're looking at the phone and speaking with people on the phone. They haven't been taught to be able to shake hands and greet people in a particular way. Those are all things that are needed in the workforce and so those need to become part of activities and um, ability that you have in your classroom to add those components so that you can engage more effectively in social communication in face-to-face -face environments. If you are teaching online, having them do interviews where you spell out, have you, have you walked up to the person, introduced yourself, and shaken their hand. Those are the types of things that are important to put into our curricula as we are teaching other subjects. 
I've included a number of different additional readings in case any of you are working on advising and student success. Um, there are a number of links to um, articles and resources that you can use here. Additionally, I've included some books that I would encourage you to read. Certainly, Robot Proof of Higher Education by Joseph Owen, who is the president of Northeastern University, is one that I would encourage all faculty and staff to read in higher education. I think that this is uh, the, the, the current environment with what, digit, with what technology is doing to our world and how it will continue to change our world is vitally important. Ray is going to share with you a number of those changes and how those things will impact not only Generation Z, but the next generation as well. So with that, I will open to any questions. Thank you so much, Vicki. And um, any of our attendees, if you have questions, we'll take a couple for Vicki on Generation Z students before we um, move on to Ray's part of the presentation. Uh, I did have one question, Vicki, while I'm waiting for um, our attendees to type in. Uh, you had talked about great um, characteristics of Gen Z students and maybe some of their learning preferences. I know that your teaching faculty at UIS um, in the graduate program, have you noticed Gen Z students um, in your graduate program? And could you give maybe like one or two examples of specific ways you've changed either your teaching style or your assignments to better respond to your Gen Z students? Um, sure, so some of the things that um, I found helpful when working with students is to allow them creativity in using different digital devices. So rather than having something that's device specific, ha let them have the creativity to use a device to um, show how they have mastered a particular outcome. For instance, perhaps um, I want them to write a paper about a particular um, theory in English as a Second Language Learning. But instead of saying a paper, I will ask them to produce a product that will show that they have mastered that content area. So some of them may choose a paper. Others may choose to build a website. Others may choose to create a video. And so allowing them the opportunity to utilize digital tools to show me that they have mastered that content has been one very well received way of working with students to allow them to be very creative. And this generation particularly loves the creativity that is provided through tools that are available on their phones, but certainly um, through other means as well. Awesome, thank you. And I noticed our um Simulcast added on to that, the multiple means of rep representation, which is coming from the universal design for learning principles and engagement. Um, do you see those, I would think, having a big impact on how we approach Zen, Gen Z as, um, as educators? Absolutely. And universal design is um, certainly something that all generations will, um, will actually find positive as we use un universal design principles in our courses. That will help all of our students to be able to learn more effectively and utilize the, the learning techniques that really work for them. You know, we talked a little bit, um, I just briefly mentioned the idea of customization and having different patterns pathways to learning also helps our students. Some students may learn by reading, others may learn by hearing, others may learn by doing, and so if we need to approach the way that we pr provide content so that we have content that's available that can be read, maybe through um, an accessibility reader, or perhaps we have podcasts that are posted. If we do provide podcasts, we also need to provide um, the script so that if necessary, we can go back and read that. If we have opportunities for students to use various modalities to input, intake the content area, that will help them in really customizing their educational experience and being able to learn more deeply. Thank you very much. 
Um, I have one question from Maria. Um, as a millennial, I remember using technology and teachers using traditional classroom tools. Would my generation be considered fidgetal? Uh, you are right on the cusp, Maria. So it would depend on whether you're an older millennial or a younger millennial. There are actually three different segments of the millennial generation. There's the oldest generation that is most like Gen X. There's a very middle point of millennials who both were adapting to um, the idea of technology and and uh, really had technology played a whole lot of uh, of of importance in the way that they were being um, taught in K-12 education. And then the youngest millennial group is really most like the Gen Z group in the fact that they used a lot of technology in both K-12 and certainly when they got to college. So it's very, very possible that you are also in the digital generation. Thank you, Vicki. Um, we have a question from our simulcast group. They ask, are there still students in Gen Z that prefer traditional methods? Of course, there are always, always, in any generation that you talk about, you have some of the veteran generation who loves technology. You have um, people at all ages. So when we talk about different generations, we're talking about a generalization of characteristics. And so no one group of characteristics is going to describe everyone within a generation. And some Gen Z students do indeed love a traditional approach. And hopefully many of them have learned um, to love reading and will continue to read, whether on a device or in a book. But the whole idea that um, that a generation has certain characteristics is is very broad and we should never lose track of the fact that our students are individuals and we should approach as much as possible with a variety of teaching techniques and not to a simple subscription to only one thing. Thank you Vicki and we'll take one more um, question for you and then we'll move on to Ray. So Great. Stephanie Horton, one of our English faculty um, she says, I'm an English professor teaching mostly composition courses. Um, I'm interested in learning and implementing multiple means of engagement in the classroom. What might be some options for a composition classroom since it would seem difficult to allow students to present via video or non-written methods in a writing course? Sure, that's, that's um, a really good question. One of the things that can be done is to provide video feedback to the student on their composition. So sometimes what you're doing is you are adding in content that is presented through different modalities or you are providing direct feedback from students in different modalities. So if your students are preparing and writing their content and you provide a video um, of yourself or a podcast of yourself providing feedback, that's another way to mix it up a little bit. Additionally, it's really important to realize that, especially Especially in a comp class, you can use a lot of different types of writing tools and technology that allow students to do things that can be very creative, such as using iAuthor, which would allow them to bring in a number of different images and techniques to, um, to enhance the text that they're learning to write. Wonderful. And I share our simulcast group kind of piggybacked on that and gave some other options even having the students write scripts for videos or do storyboarding or other ways to write, but still give those sure. different options. Absolutely. Great Thank idea. you very much. So at this time, I will turn the presentation over to Ray. Thank you very much, um, Vicki. And uh, Ray, welcome. Hi, thank you. And it's great to be here. And I certainly uh, want to say thanks to my colleague Vicki Cook, as well as Carrie Levin, our Assistant Director of Colors, who are both here in, uh, uh, as we do this uh, webinar. Um, I, I'd like to add just uh, uh, one reinforcement to what Vicki said about our presentation style. For the last dozen years, uh, when we present, we, we tend to use uh, well, previously blogger, but then websites. And we believe that this platform is far better than PowerPointless, with an emphasis on pointless, because PowerPoint is static and it, it can't easily be updated. It's, uh, it forces 
you as an audience to follow us. But right now, you can be scrolling down and clicking on links and playing videos. And, you know, you can follow your interest. And that's really our goal in these presentations. And I think that that fits us very well. Um, I'm talking about technologies, but uh, I will say I'm not going to talk about specific apps um, because apps come and go, uh, specific technologies come and go, but I want to talk, kind of emphasize a couple of trends. Um, one in the area of artificial intelligence, the other in, uh, uh, as we take a look at the next step in computing and moving to quantum computing and how that's going to impact us. So let me begin with this very brief introduction of Education 4.0 and looking at the future. The speed of the coming together of technologies, globalization, and people thinking in different ways in terms of expectations and aspirations means that we have to learn new things and learn in a different ways. You know, it took us thousands of years to move from caveman to create the car. And then it took us tens of years to move from car to aeroplane. And then it took us a few years to move from aeroplanes to, to computers. And you see this shortening of time all the time. And therefore, the shortening of education is responding to that shortening of the way in which the world is changing. So it's the speed of technology and it's the speed of adoption of new technologies which is making it happen. We used to go to school and then we went to university or business school and then we think we don't need to learn anymore for the rest of our lives. But we're all going to live to 100 or more. And so we're going to go through many, many phases of, of, of change in our own lives and our own careers. So we're going to have to keep learning and keep moving forwards. But learning in this new way, it's incredibly exciting. What we need to do is to start making sense of the changing world and making sense of the new opportunities for us. We shouldn't be intimidated by the world. We shouldn't feel as though we have to learn everything. But what we should have is our own vision. What do we want to achieve? How can we make the world better? And how do we want to live our lives? And then find the knowledge and find the skills when we need them in order to help us to do that. Well, uh, most prescient as uh, described there, the, the idea of living 100 years, and there's a, a, a wonderful uh, book out that has driven a lot of discussion in our field, a hundred year life, uh, which has led to the 60 year learner and uh, uh, the concept that in fact, because in part of technology, first medical technology, which is allowing the life expectancy for everyone born after the year 2000 in this country to expect a hundred year life, um, but also broadly in employment and uh, in business and industry that the advent and the continuing development of technology uh, will require students to come back to us at our colleges in order to obtain certifications and uh, update their learning for new jobs such as uh, uh, was described by Vicky. We also are moving from a push approach to a pull reality. And I often talk about this as if we were uh, in one of my favorite fields, uh, donut vending. So if we're Krispy Kreme donuts, uh, we've been pushing out donuts and, and selling them to the public, uh, take it or leave it, and come to our college or not. But uh, a couple of things have happened. Because of the rapidity of change in the fields, we're selling now day old and oh, gasp, week old donuts. That is, we may be actually delivering uh, degrees. Our associates may be in fact um, out of date before those students hit the field. Um, but also uh, students are coming and choosing. Uh, they have a broad selection. It's not like it was 25 years ago when you would go to the nearest campus. Now you can simply go online and get a plethora of options, including 5,000 MOOCs out there, entire degrees delivered by Coursera and edX and Udacity and others. 
so so the whole field is is really changing um, as described here 15 or more employers now of these top employers that includes IBM you can click on that I guess I will for for just a second but uh, um, you might look at Google or you might look at IBM or Ernst & Young and you know what they say no degree no problem you know we'll hire you you don't need a degree to work for us and so that's that's a real challenge so let's see here do I get back? Is that working? Yes. We're back. I'm back. Good. Okay. Yeah. So um, I mentioned some of the fields that we should be working for and with are blockchain uh, and high demand fields, um, and certainly incorporating technologies as we move forward, the ones that are going to be in demand. Um, Harvard Business Review, and, and by the way, I put the dates on many of these, trying to keep current. Most of these are in the last two months. Um, does higher ed still prepare people for jobs? And there's a real question about that. Certainly employers are wondering whether we're really doing our job as they hope we will. Chris Eady at Harvard also has uh, described the 60-year curriculum. The idea that a student will enter Harvard, for example, perhaps when they're 18 or 17, dual credit, maybe 16, but uh, they'll continue with Harper until they're 77 because their life expectancy is 100 years. So we're going to need to, uh, to serve learners much longer than we have in the past, and that's driven by technology. Well, uh, some upskilling and, and others, and you can drill down into those. Um, I'm going to play a portion of this uh, next video. I think it's important for us to understand the essence of artificial intelligence. I think many of us look at that as a kind of a, a, a cloud or a, a blob. AI does this, so I just ask AI and they'll do this, and, and we don't have a sense of how it all connects. And so this is artificial intelligence for people in a hurry. However, uh, you know, and it's quite condensed. Uh, I found I, I needed to look at it a couple or three times. But let me just give you this brief uh, first half of this, uh, this five-minute video. Artificial intelligence for people in a hurry. The easiest way to think about artificial intelligence is in the context of a human. After all, humans are the most intelligent creatures we know of. AI is a broad branch of computer science. The goal of AI is to create systems that can function intelligently and independently. Humans can speak and listen to communicate through language. This is the field of speech recognition. Much of speech recognition is statistically based, hence it's called statistical learning. Humans can write and read text in a language. This is the field of NLP, or natural language processing. Humans can see with their eyes and process what they see. This is the field of computer vision. Computer vision falls under the symbolic way for computers to process information. Recently, there's been another way, which I'll come to later. Humans recognize the scene around them through their eyes which create images of that world. This field of image processing, which even though is not directly related to AI, is required for computer vision. Humans can understand their environment and move around fluidly. This is the field of robotics. Humans have the ability to see patterns, such as grouping of like objects. This is the field of pattern recognition. Machines are even better at pattern recognition because they can use more data and dimensions of data. This is the field of machine learning. I encourage you to go through this so that you get a sense of deep learning um, and machine learning, which are the, the key components. More likely, those are what are driving what you're uh, looking at in uh, and calling artificial intelligence. And, and here's an article on uh, machine and deep learning. Uh, 
Um, delivering opportunities at scale with the help of AI. One of the things that's really going on is uh, kind of this exciting experiment started four years ago at Georgia Tech. Professor Ashok Gold in this video uh, also describes it. He is a professor of computer science. Many of you know that Georgia Tech, through Udacity, with their help and the help of AT&T, um, developed a, an at-scale master's program in computer science. And uh, he, uh, he then had to teach his class on artificial intelligence to a group of 400 students. Well, he was given six TAs and he added one, seven TAs to teach these 400 students. One of his was not so good, Jill, as he describes, was kind of bumbling and not, not really up to the task. But by the end of the semester was so good that she was nominated for TA of the year. But of course, you'll note the name over here is Jill Watson. And she was a Watson computer program that answered questions from the students, handled the discussion board along with the six other TAs, not a single student raised in this artificial intelligence class aspect that she might in fact not be human. Um, very successful and I've had the opportunity to meet with Asha uh, three times now and, and he's developing uh, his program so that it can run um, on uh, other platforms and could be uh, as little as $15,000. So, for example, Harper could purchase this program for assistant students in discussion boards at that price point. That, that could be very exciting. Then that raises the question, could AI replace our teachers? Well, not likely or not soon. Um, maybe in some classes that, that, that is possible. But what we're seeing much more of is that they can, in fact, uh, provide us the um, uh, the ability to personalize learning, which is, if you will, the holy grail in uh, education, be able to teach one-on-one -on -one. instead of aiming at the average in a class or the top of the class or the bottom of the class to be able to adapt our materials. And uh, um, I'll, I'll leave this video. It's a very good one. I encourage you to take a look at that as well. Uh, and the promise of personalized learning. I, I had just uh, uh, recently written an article in Inside Higher Ed this year on that very topic. Um, there are some that suggest rather than AI, we should have IA. Um, uh, as described here, is IA is intelligence amplification, artificial intelligence. Right now, we see a lot of IA at the doctor's office where the doctor is typing on a computer or maybe leaves the exam room and looks up things online and uh, uh, gets information and then retransmits it or applies it to you in the form of prescriptions and treatments. There is some concern that has been expressed by Stephen Hawking, the late Stephen Hawking among others, uh, including um, Bill Gates, uh, Elon Musk, Steve Wozniak, we're concerned that AI is so powerful it could get out of out of control if we don't carefully monitor uh, what's going on in AI and and that we continue to uh, uh, administer AI. Well, I think what's most important in the near future, and we're going to see it rolling out this year, is uh, quantum quantum computing and uh, the the significant. Uh, advent of uh, quantum computing is that it uses qubits. So we're all familiar with bits, bits which provide us a one or a zero. Well, qubits, which are, if you will, the bits used by quantum computers, give the one and the zero, but also one and zero, and also a kind of a phasing or probability of the use of one and zero. And so this allows so much more processing power, storage power for quantum computing. It will ramp up what we're doing by, gosh, 10,000 fold, truly. It's, it's just a massive change that we're going to begin seeing. There are two hints in this video. I'll show you just the first. AI, AI in 2019? Hot dog, not hot dog.
at the same time. What, what, what's that hot dog, not hot dog at the same time? Well, what he's talking about is quantum, right? Hot dog, not a hot dog. And the third uh, factor is... Hello world. Hello world, it's Siraj. And 2019 is gonna be an incredible year for the AI community. I'm gonna briefly recap some of the major highlights in the field from 2018, then use some of those highlights to make 10 predictions on what's gonna happen in 2019. The subset of AI, deep learning, has accounted for the majority of the public discourse on AI in 2018. We've seen some incredible new applications of it so far, but let me start by stating something that might shock you. Even though I'm ethnically Indian, my mom was born in Kenya, which technically makes me an African American, but besides- Okay, I'm stopping with that piece that uh, note he is Indian, he's also concurrently African-American. That can be set, stored on one qubit, and it's phenomenal, the speed of these computers. I would suggest that you carefully look at these questions. And um, after just pointing out a couple of these, I'm gonna stop. Um, what are you doing to assure that you're teaching and also how you're teaching is going to be relevant to graduates in this context in five years. Um, is our pedagogy advancing and adapting to the kind of learning that we're going to see among those 60-year learners? Are we sure the career path that we're preparing is gonna be there in five years? Are we preparing our colleagues to keep up with the rate of change and, and the like? So um, these, I think, are important questions. We, we just don't have the time for them um, here our contact information and I'm going to stop now. Thank you so much Ray. There's so many amazing things to think about. Um, at this point I'll open it up to our attendees if you have any questions for Ray before we close out. Um, while I'm waiting for any attendees to type, you mentioned briefly at the beginning um, the blockchain of education and I know I've, I've heard you speak about that in other times. Um, could you just say um, in, I don't know how brief it, it can be to talk about blockchain, but how that's impacting education today. Sure, sure, in 30 seconds or less. Yeah, that's uh, right. A blockchain is a secure ledger. Uh, it's not totally unlike the internet, but it is totally secure. Uh, it is what drives Bitcoin. It is the vehicle for us to share transcripts, to share information with others that is secured in a network so that uh, you can build upon uh, that ledger for an individual. And what it will do is it will allow your students and our students to take MOOCs from Harvard, from uh, uh, the University of Pennsylvania, from you name it, from major universities, and in essence, add them to their transcript, to their virtual transcript. Amazing, thank you. Um, we have one final question I'll take from the simulcast group. Um, what might be some methods for adapting teaching materials to become a more personalized learning experience? Yeah, I think that what we're going to see is using AI in order to um, address these needs of students. So, you know, certainly there is adaptive learning available now. Smart Sparrow is one we looked into. Newton is another that's largely, I think, still uh, provided through a big publisher. Which publisher is that? I, oh, uh, Pearson. Yeah. So, um, so there, those technologies are there. And what they do, uh, adaptive learning, based on the answers the students give, they help guide them in tutorials at the level uh, to help uh, help them overcome the misunderstanding, the deficit in understanding. Uh, that they represent in the way in which they answered the question. So yes, certainly we can use AI in adaptive learning, but with quantum computers and with AI as it uh, becomes even more robust, we'll be able to pro provide this uh, to students on a daily basis in our classes. Ray, adaptive learning also helps customize the content for Gen Z. Oh, yeah, okay, yes, and uh, Vicki says, yes, and Gen Z, it helps customize the content for Gen Z. Yes, I heard Vicki echoing in, and um, that was great. So um, 
at this point, I'd really like to thank um, Vicki and Ray uh, and Carrie also for your help today. Um, thank you so much for your time and sharing all of your fantastic expertise. Big thank you to all of our attendees, both uh, virtually and in the live session. Uh, we will provide a recording of this webinar soon on HIP and on the Academy for Teaching Excellence webpage. We'll also provide the link to Vicki and Ray's presentation website. So the links to all of the videos, both the ones that they showed um, and the other ones that are in there will be available for you to watch. Um, but I hope you all enjoyed this webinar. We've got more Tech Week events going on all week. Uh, you can search for Tech Week on HIP to get the full schedule. So Vicki and Ray, thank you so much for being here today. It was wonderful. Thank you for inviting us. Thank, thank you. you. Absolutely. Uh, and with that, we will close out our webinar for today. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day. Thank you all.